Amid the bustle of Brighton Ship Street and those famous lanes, there's a pointer to a place of peace. Set quietly back in its lovely gardens is the Friends Meeting House. Thousands must pass these signs, but how many read them? Do they know that Brighton's Quakers have been here for over 250 years? And today the Quaker community is very active and open to all. People will pop into the cafe, but do they ask themselves just who are the Quakers? Over centuries their meeting room has changed, but people still gather here to sit, usually in silence. This is a small midweek meeting, and among the Quakers are several anthropology students from the University of Sussex. Their project is to find out something of the history of the Quakers and their way of life in the 21st century. I'm Alex, and I'm a first-year anthropology student. Hello, I'm Ben. I'm a tender, soon to be a member, over the next couple of months. Hello, I'm Francesca, first-year anthropology student. Hello, I'm Caroline, and I'm a member of Brighton Meeting. Hi, I'm James, and I'm a first-year anthropology student at Sussex. I'm Jonathan, and I'm a member and elder of Brighton Meeting. I'm Alice, and I'm studying anthropology at Sussex in my first year. I'm Sheila, I'm a member of Brighton Quaker Meeting. Hi, I'm Charlie, a first-year anthropology student also. Firstly, what we would like to know is who exactly are the Quakers, if you can possibly give us a description. Mm. Yes, the short answer is that we are. <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe yourselves? Um, well, I guess we're fairly ordinary. Well, I feel fairly ordinary anyway. I don't, I don't know. I'll let you be the judge of that, really. Um, but, I mean, Quakers is only one name. I mean, perhaps that's a place to start. It's only one name that gets used about it. I think the official title is the Religious Society of Friends. Yeah. Um, mm. And uh, that's not quite the original title, but it's changed a bit over the years. But Quakers started as a term of abuse used by a judge in a, in a court case, okay. and the Quakers decided that they would adopt that because they weren't, they weren't troubled by abuse. They thought, mm. well, we'll just embrace that. Uh, mm. yeah. so, that's, so that's where the name comes from. So you'll hear both uh, terms used, sometimes called friends, um, sometimes the religious society, and sometimes Quakers, and all of those Wh things. Which one would you prefer to be called? Okay. We tend to refer to ourselves as Quakers or Friends, but the, the problem with Friends is, you know, it's obviously a kind of common word as well. So, mm -hmm. um, but Quakers have been around for 350 years, wow. and this meeting house has been open for 200 years. So, wow. um, yeah. And Quakerism has its roots in Christianity, is that right? Is it, or? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Quakers, Quakers certainly originally was very much. A, regarded itself as a, as a Christian um, body. I think nowadays there's a whole range of opinions from people who are fairly traditionally Christian to people who are um, what's called universalist, but you may might think of maybe as agnostic, perhaps. Um, oh, so you don't have to be Christian to be a Quaker? No, I wouldn't say so. No, well, if the evidence of, of, of today is that, 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 that no, that's not the case. There are many people who are part of Brighton meeting who would quite certainly describe themselves as not Christian. Um, so that might be due to the term rather than to their actual faith. I think a lot of people mm. have a problem with the word Christian, mm. but they might find their faith is actually quite strongly attached to the teachings of Jesus or or aspects of the Christian faith. But mm. but Quakers are quite different. Mm. So. I think that's. Massive interest to me personally, the fact that you can have so many conflicting possible ideologies within one mm. religious umbrella. Mm. I heard it was like, about 60% Christian. Really? Do you know, because mm. there was a, we met a Buddhist guy here before, mm. Mm. And, and didn't you say that you could be an atheist even? Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. They do use those terms about themselves. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a, I mean, the terminology in a way doesn't really interest us. I think we're much more interested in the process of how people get to, their, to, to where they are today. And we also understand, as I understand about myself, is that it's a constantly changing process. And sticking a label on ourselves and saying, today I'm this, uh, perhaps isn't that useful really. What's more interesting to us is how we got there and what we do with this. So you know, where journey. do I go next? Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Journey gets a word that gets used a lot. Yes. Yeah. Journey. Yeah. That's an yeah. important word. Yeah. 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 I think the other thing is, um, certainly for me, is 
I, I, I should say this really because I think Quakers do tend to speak for themselves rather than for Quakers. Um, but for me, um, I'm much more interested in um, the experience of being a Quaker than in beliefs. So in a way, I think that's quite different from a lot of the Christian churches where there's a creed that you have to subscribe to and everything. For me, it's the process of worship, the being part of a community, all that kind of thing matters a lot more to me than what people actually believe. Which is why you're such an interesting yeah. group to, to actually study, because we actually are looking at communities, and apparently mm. you've made yourself a, a small community that isn't even necessarily structured on belief, mm. even though it's a, a religious group. It's, really well, it's, it's structured on, a, on an openness to, mm. to belief. I mean, you can come here, wherever you're at, you can come here, you know, and you come here and you start from wherever you are on your on your journey because everyone's on a journey whether they they're aware of it or not yes. um so you you know you can start from from where you're at right now whatever your faith is and and come here and, and sort of grow from there there are there are five main principles to quakerism such as that if we speak testimonies, testimonies. testimonies. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're more sort of I guess there's a, those are the. I mean, to say that we have no beliefs, I guess, is also misleading. In that there are also. It seems that people who follow this process seem to come to a series of a series of understandings. Now, not everybody does, and they're certainly not compulsory by any means. But over the 350 year period, there have been five experiences that people seem to share. Um, and I'm now going to try now and trot those off. <laughs> this is a challenge. Here's the challenge. Um, they are, uh, they are the, the peace testimony, which is more the absence of conflict than, than I, for me anyway, that's how I understand that. And, uh, and that certainly started as, a, as an outward thing that, 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 that Quaker spoke against wars. Mm. Um, but that's become much wider now. Uh, other testimonies are also, to, honestly, truthfulness, the truth. Is, uh, I mean, that was another early name for Quakers, was Friends of the Truth. Okay. I don't know where that went. I think personally it's rather a large claim for any <laughs> people. But, uh, but uh, um, the others are simplicity. Um, a basic simple life. And that sometimes gets translated as plainness, but that's not really the heart of it. It is, it is, it's really, I think, for me, another face of, 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 of truth. The, the, mm. thing, the truth tends to be quite... Not over-complicating things. Yes. And, mm. and, um, I mean, there is a sort of image of Quakers sometimes as being against frippery or against dancing or against... <laughs> and there was, there, was a, there was a period in Quaker history where that was the case, but there's not always been all Quakers, and I don't think it's certainly not the case today. That's another really interesting slant, actually, how Quakerism has changed over the years. Cause mm. Mm. But then I guess that's partly because we would see it as evolving, um, you know, in a way. Although we have our, our book, Quaker Faith and Practice, that's an ever-evolving thing and, and it gets revised, I don't know how often, every 30 years or 40 years and so, you know, fresh insights get put really in, things, 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 that, get, groups, things that are dated get taken out. Um, but also some of the history is in Quaker Faith and Practice as well mm -hmm. and that's why I absolutely love it because it's got, it's all personal experiences, it's nobody saying you believe this, you, you know, this is, this is the dogma, this is the faith, it's individual people's individual experience throughout history that's and it's really amazing amazed. how you can relate to something that someone wrote in 1676 and mm. you know that you're having that same experience right now mm. because what they're talking about uh, I suppose are things that are eternal you know things that are, that are spiritual things of depth things of uh, people's journeys and people did have the same kind of spiritual journeys then and it, it, there's that connection runs right the way through the material world changes mm. Mm. I think it's quite That's, a nice, like, all humans seem, you know, all the same sort of thing, so everyone's accepted, sounds like. Mm. Mm. Is well, the, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say another of the testimonies is to equality, mm. um, which would... Um, in Brighton today, that seems to relate to, to people of different sexuality more than anything mm. else. Mm. Um, and um, certainly, um, you know, we would, we would very much want to consider people who are gay as being absolutely equal and um, in fact we're having discussions at the moment about uh, pressing for legislation to allow us to solemnise same-sex partnerships within the meeting. So, and we're going to gay pride next year. And we're going to gay pride, yeah. This year, in fact. So what will you be doing at, at, at Gay Pride, being Quakers? What, what, what would be the... Well, there's, there's lots of gay Quakers, gay so, and there's, just, you know, that's, that's just a... Uh, you know, they happen to be gay and they happen to be Quakers, so that's a perfect space for them to be in Brighton. <laughs> well, we're having a stall, aren't we? Basically, that's yeah. what we're doing. But we're, we're marching with the Rainbow Banners up there. 
Oh, well, I, I think it's a lot, a lot of them, I mean, Quakers are quite active politically in some sense with, with a small P, well, and with a big P too sometimes, <laughs> but, um, but uh, uh, and often people find that, that from the worship, from what they find that's eternal, often find that they, they find truths for themselves that they feel need to be acted upon. Um, and one of those, um, but they tend not to be because of the testimony of peace. Tend they tend not to go and hit policemen on the head. They tend to <laughs> run, they tend to prefer to bear witness. Yeah. Um, and you'll find that you will find people uh, Quakers often standing quietly at the edge of protests um, with a banner saying, "We're the Quakers, and here we are, and we don't like this very much." And that and that may seem very ineffectual, but in fact, over history, it's proved to be considerably more effective than hitting policemen on the head. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's certainly you know, the kind of thing perhaps we might be doing at the Pride March. We'll certainly have a stall there, so we will have a presence. And we think that carries as much, you know, we experience it, but that will carry as much of a message uh, as doing anything more vigorous. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Going back, sorry, James, going back to the point on the equality, um, women have always been seen as very equal to men, haven't they, throughout the history of Quakerism? How, how so is that? Because most religious religions are really patriarchal, aren't they? Whereas, have you never really had that history? Well, there was a, though, I mean, in the early days, certainly women didn't minister in meetings, and that, that came, I don't no, know. I didn't know that, no. I thought they did. No, they didn't. Um, it wasn't considered appropriate. And there was, there was one woman, and I've read it in Quaker Faith and Practice, I'm sorry, I don't know her name, um, but she really battled against this call inside her to minister, which is when uh, someone stands up and speaks at a Quaker meeting, and they feel called to do so. Um, because it wasn't felt appropriate for women to do that then. Um, but as soon as she, she, she did, eventually, and it released um, a, a whole spate of women starting to minister, and, and yes, of course, women are equal in that. So 1655, around then, the Quakerism started? 1652, I think. 1652. So, yes. so for, for its era, for when it was, that's quite a massive... Way ahead of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's probably worth talking a bit about worship, because so, a lot of what happens... How it comes out of worship mm -hmm. and comes out of the, the rather unique way that Quakers do worship, yeah. which again is very much about wearing, sort of bearing witness or not doing very much. It would seem in that, that, that it's based in sitting on, on in silence. And uh, and certainly when I first came, that that was a completely new approach to to everything. I'm not that I was terribly experienced in any kind of uh, worship, but, but it certainly does set it aside from yeah. other yeah. religious yeah. practices. Yeah. How do you do you yeah. feel in the How silence? do you feel like when you're in the silence? <laughs> actually, could I? Actually we we want to do ask you that actually. What do you make of sitting in silence yeah. for a period of time? I mean, it's strange because at first I it's, I thought it was sort of fairly sort of novel to be sitting in a circle and not saying anything for such a sort of extended period of time but like um, I suppose after a while of, um, of sitting there you, you start to realise that you know you're, that you're thinking about various things and you start to realise that everyone else in the circle is probably um, you know experiencing the same kind of thought patterns and you know and, and I think that's when it becomes about sort of about um, creating something through the silence. I don't know, I've only sort of experienced it a couple of times, but... It sounds very accurate to me, mm, yeah. actually. It <laughs> sounds very familiar, yes. Yeah. 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 What about the rest of you? I found it um, extremely satisfying. Mm. I didn't feel very uncomfortable. I thought I might feel a bit uncomfortable, but uh, it's not very often that you just sit down in sheer silence. We live in such a manic world. Mm. And it was really nice just to not have to think about anything in particular, mm. to take half an hour just to... Just to feel, maybe I don't know, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and you do get a sense of community, even though I don't know very many of you very well at all. Mm -hmm. It was really uniting, even though nothing was being said necessarily. Yeah, well, it's sort of like sharing silence, silence yeah. like sharing that sort of like. Oh. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I think, because we we would you know we would see it as a corporate activity, and in that sense, I think it's different from meditation, mm -hmm. um, which is often people often do meditate in groups, but also very much alone. Mm -hmm. Whereas that kind of feeling that you're doing it there with other people is very much part of Quaker worship. And it's really. a circular thing where you will sort of sit in a circle as well, which gives it that kind of communal feeling yeah. as well, I think. Yeah. Well, you can see everybody, mm. you know, you're, you're, you're not, so you haven't got your back to anyone, and you're, mm. yes, you are all part of the same. And no one's more important than anyone else. Yeah, that's yes. great. Yeah. Which, which brings us to the UN elder. Oh, yes, I did mention that. <laughs> what does that, that title mean to you, or to Quakers in general? Uh, it's a good question. I'm, I'm new to the job, so I'm perhaps not the best person to speak to it, but I mean, it, doesn't, it doesn't, certainly doesn't carry any authority. Um, it certainly doesn't mean that my voice is any, any, carries any more weight in the society than anyone else's. I've just taken on a, a degree of, of 
uh, I suppose, um, sort of responsibility for um, the safe provision of, of, of worship space and uh, and for the uh, the sort of spiritual welfare of the meeting. To so, so I mean, I, as I say, it's an evolving role for me. I mean, so far it's really involved having breakfast um, <laughs> and um, uh, with other elders and, um, and mulling over some some points that have been brought to us by by the community, really. But we certainly don't have any kind of authority. How long have you been an elder for? Just a couple of months. It's, it's okay. sort of three year gig, really. Because <laughs> yeah. um, uh, that's that's another thing. Um, if you are an elder, it changes, doesn't it? You're never yeah, stuck in that yeah, kind of does it for role. Too long. No. Mm. Mm. Otherwise, um, somebody might start thinking that they had. Uh, so it a, encourages a your ideas of equality, I suppose. Yeah. 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 I think the other thing to say is that um, um, I think people outside Quakers say we don't have priests, but actually the Quaker way of looking at it is we don't have laity. That everyone. You know, is a priest to to the community, if you like. So there's, we certainly don't have specific designated priests. We're all responsible for the welfare of the meeting. We're all responsible for the welfare of each other. And we all have insights into um, the spiritual life of the community and our own spiritual lives as well. And everyone's insights are as valid as everyone else's. So within a meeting, when someone feels called called to speak and share one of those insights or one of those. Um, ideas then then they do so and that's that's listened to by the whole community and taken on board and, and we sort of share in those ideas that's, that's also where the term quakers comes from it's very often when people are called to speak they will quake <laughs> and it was initially used as a derogatory term mm. but then reclaimed by the quakers mm. and it actually is quite scary to yeah. stand up in an empty room and speak and then sit down and no one no one sort of verbally responds to you. It's, anything, are you? Yeah, it's very. It can be quite daunting, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly, at first, it could be quite daunting. There's a really nice um, quotes read today. Yes. Yeah. That lady. I'm yes. Not sure sometimes people name. will read from from mm. Quaker faith and practice as well. Yeah. Yeah, that was actually one of the advices and queries. It sounds like something from the back page of the Guardian, but it's actually. Um, <laughs> um, but it, it, it's actually that's again that's something that's grown up over years. I mean, so much of, of, of Quakerism has grown rather than ever, anyone sitting down and writing it in tablets of stone. And this this grew initially out of um, concerns that because the Quakers were quite separated as a group of people, and they were quite small groups, and and they would write letters to each other, and sort of they would say, well. Uh, greetings from Nottingham. How many of you are in prison? How many of you have died recently? How many of you? Uh, because they were they had quite they were they were quite sort of. Uh, they, they had quite a difficult relationship with, with state religion early on. Um, it became more acceptable, but, but, but most of them were in prison for their beliefs. And, um, and so they did send around these sort of queries about each other, and, and they tried to sort of keep tabs on who, how many new members there were and how many, how many people were, were in trouble. And, uh, uh, and, and, and so that developed a habit of writing letters to each other with, with these queries. And then that gradually grew into a longer list of, of people, a longer list of questions. And then it started, people started inquiring about each other's sort of spiritual welfare. And gradually, sort of 300 years later, we've now got 42 of these advices and queries. And they're very much, many of them are um, voiced as questions. Um, but they're quite challenging questions. I mean, sort of along the lines of, you know, to what extent do you allow God into your life? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not actually a quote, but that's the kind of thing that they are. <laughs> <laughs> and you sort of sit and think, oh, well, hmm, not sure today, actually. But, uh, and there's 42 of them, and they range everything from the sort of the practical to the, to the quite esoteric. And, and what you heard today was, was number 17, which, uh, which uh, is, is quite a popular I found that really, it gave me lots to think about. It was, it was a very nice quote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, does anybody really like to offer uh, how you why you became a Quaker, or what brought you to it, or what attracted you to it? <laughs> I was initially attracted by the lack of rules, lack of dogma. I had a lot of problems with Christian terminology, mm -hmm. um, and I was drawn to my spiritual side, but didn't want to be told that this is what you should believe, this is what you should experience, this is how it is. And through coming here and having the experiences I've experienced, the best way I've been able to describe them is through Christian terminology. So I found I've come full circle from running away from Christian terminology. I now use that same terminology to describe my experiences. Um, 
Maybe now you know what it means. I mean, yes. they're not just yeah. words, are they? Yeah. Not just sort of abstract words, but they're words yeah. that have a meaning because mm. they're based mm. in your experience, yeah. which is what Quakers is all about, really. It's about actual experience, mm. you know, drawing from your own experience, not not a set of words. It's really that individual, been... isn't it? Oh. Really yes, it is. But yeah. at the very... same time, you should get a sense of community, though. Yeah. And that's yeah. what's really, really interesting. It poses quite a lot of sort of problems for us as anthropologists. <laughs> <so, laughs> <laughs> It's kind of sort of on, on the borderline between sort of a religion and, and a community. And I suppose, like, the big question we're trying to answer is sort of, is Quakerism a religion? And we're not really sure. <laughs> Can anyone give us any answer? <laughs> well, you have to define religion before yeah. we can yeah. yeah. answer question, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think that those two words work very well together as a religious community or mm. a spiritual community mm. or a faith community, sometimes I find myself saying, um, that, that what brings us together is that we all have a faith in something. And that's really the, where we unify. I mean, I think there is more unity than perhaps we give. Uh, we, we've, we've stressed very much the diversity, mm. but there does seem to be also a unity. We, we, we perhaps don't spend very much time talking about it because it's assumed and understood. Mm. Um, but there are basic ideas. I mean, I suppose they show themselves in the testimonies, and there are other phrases that get used from history, from sort of historical Quakers, and that tend to sort of bind people together. That, again, not everybody agrees with them, and, and they are about seeing that of God in everybody. Um, there's a certain joyfulness, I think, about Quakers. And I think binds people together as well. Um, a certain um, lack of pessimism. I wouldn't necessarily say optimism, but a certain lack of pessimism. I don't think that people find despair a terribly useful trait in, in Quakerism. And perhaps that's true of other faiths too, I don't know. But, um, but certainly that those are, there are qualities about Quakerism that do draw us together. And when you get a few Quakes together and start talking about it, we do seem to find things that we have in common. But it might be a different thing on a different day. But there are, there are certainly things that bind us. Uh, as well as the diversity. Yeah. I was going to say, I think the real problem about is Quaker is a religion is that it feels to me like those religions that have very fixed belief have kind of defined what religion is, and if you don't fit into that box, then you're not religious. <laughs> and actually, I think that there is a whole mass of people outside who are looking for some kind of spirituality but actually don't want to swallow that whole dogma thing. Um... I mean, I would say most people here probably do have some kind of feeling of something beyond themselves, and you can use the word God if that suits you, but it may not suit you. Um, and, and a feeling that when you come to worship, you're trying to get in touch with that. You might think of it as a deeper part of yourself, but I think it's easy, you know, it's how you think of it is, is best to think of it how you find it most useful to you in a way. Which brings us back to yeah. the idea that it's really... Yeah. It's really subjective. Yeah. Quakers will often talk about the light within, which is an experience many of us will have had in meeting. But how you interpret that light within is very personal. So if we, if we talk about our experience of meeting, in, in pure terms it would be similar. But I've chosen to interpret it using Christian terminology. If someone comes from a Buddhist background, they may see that as the pure self. Um, if someone's a humanist, they could just talk about it as pure energy. So it's that part's individual, but we all have the similar experience, which is where we can connect. Do, do any two people ever conflict? Because obviously, obviously, the aim is to be passive. So yes, so be that, has to be possible. that has to be possible. I mean, in order mm. to, to, to run the country. Yeah, to be as a community as we are, and there is a, and to be a diverse community, yes. which we are. There are, there are, yeah, yeah, there, of there course, are quite sharp differences sometimes. Yeah. Does it ever combat in a not a physical sense, obviously? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. Might <laughs> happen. <laughs> 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 yeah. Verbally, do you ever have debates or discussions over differences in beliefs or backgrounds? We wouldn't set that up formally yeah, because I don't think well, that's the, the outcome. Meeting. But well, there's open. We do have. A, I mean, Brighton meeting and other meetings have an open meeting, which is more of a discussion forum. But the purpose of that isn't to come to any agreement. Um, mm. The purpose of that is to, to, to find no, a place. I, where I we suppose can more what I was asking is, does conflict ever happen? Like mm. with because with such a diverse group, it's, you're mm. bound to. It, it does. Slight conflicts. What Quakers have found very useful is that there aren't any obvious answers sometimes when there's a conflict, and sometimes you just have to wait. Mm -hmm. And if you wait as a, as a Corinthian, especially if you wait in worship or in a, in a worshipful space, in silence, in a, in, a, in a gathering, somehow those conflicts can, can dissolve. You know, they actually can, sometimes you can actually find an answer that you had no idea was, was there, and it, it can come just through waiting and through, through sitting in silence. 
I think the other thing to say is that we are human beings, and so, yes, conflict. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, you know, it, it, what it feels to me like is a bit really like a family in the sense that, you know, sometimes your family drive you absolutely bonkers, <laughs> but there's still your family in the end, you know. Mm. I think the day I knew that I was going to join Quakers was, you know, when kind of stomping home thinking, oh... And I kind of knew that I'd still always come, despite feeling that. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, conflict does occur, and, and, you know, sometimes we drive each other mad. But, um, but, that's, okay, but that's okay, really. You no, it's, know. it's been said that if there are two quakes in a the room, then there are three points of view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And it's worth, I mean, it's worth noticing as well that... that, that Quakers do get asked to resolve other people's disputes. I mean, they have a tradition of having offices uh, at places like the United Nations um, where, where people very quietly come and, and perhaps start, start resolving their, their conflicts. I mean, I don't know whether they're more successful than others in that or not, but there's a long history of them certainly being available to, to do that, to mediate, but without a, it's not a very active thing in terms of they tend to, as I understand, I don't know other people might have more experience with how the UN office works, but I think there's just an empty office mm -hmm. and a Quaker sat in it. And anybody, who wants to, and anybody who wants to come and sort of vent their spleen about the, the nation that they're at war with or whatever, or, or their own government or whatever, then they come in and they kind of do that. Um, and, and, and then perhaps the other side, or somebody from a completely different conflict, might come in and do the same thing the next uh, narrator. And, that, and I, as I understand it, the Quaker office might then say, well, you know, would you like me to pass that on? Or would you like me to, uh, you know, how much of that would you like me to share as a, as a, as a sort of third party? And, that, and information does get shared in this sort of very non judgmental mm -hmm. way. And that's the beginnings of contact between people who cannot seem to share a space and cannot share a dialogue. So they start to, because it is a blank, try to be as blank a page as possible and allow people to write their own scripts on that. And I suppose a Quaker would be really well equipped to handle such situations because mm. of such, as we were just talking about conflict and diverse opinions and backgrounds. Mm. So I see how that's, that could happen. And also, also Quakers do um, practice listening quite a lot. And we can also talk about sort of listening to the silence within a meeting or listening to. Um, listening to the spirit within. You know, Quakers, Quakers are quite happy just to listen, not necessarily to speak, but just to listen. So I can see that their, their role there could be quite useful. Um, and it also means that they, because they listen without judgment, they can be quite a helpful support network. I mean, we all support each other a lot in the meeting, you know, and, and we're able to do that because we're, we're good listeners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, there's a sort of tradition of pacifism within Quakerism. Like, for example, if, and I suppose more specifically, like, the testimonies, like, if, if, do you sort of have to sort of subscribe to them to, in order to be a Quaker? I mean, is there sort of any, like, any criteria at all, like, to sort of, towards becoming a Quaker? Or there's a, if there's you... a debate about um, the term pacifism and peacemaker. Right. A lot of people would rather use the term peacemaker because it's more positive, mm. it shows. Um, pacifism can suggest withdrawing from a situation. Right. I think, um, in, I mean, in the tradition of uh, <coughs> sort of uh, pacifism, so, you know, certainly in the two world wars, a lot of Quakers, I think, were were pacifists. And um, you may have heard of the Friends Ambulance Unit, which mm. was set up in World War One, mm. and was a kind of alternative to the military service for for Quakers and for other people actually who joined. Mm. Um, but there's a there's a kind of I just wanted to pick up something you said because you used the word passive and I, t I kind of take issue with that because I don't think being a peacemaker means being passive. You know, I think being a peacemaker is actually about being very dynamic. And one of the things about peacemaking is things like justice and equality because, you know, it's looking at what causes war as well as... That shows my preconception creeping in there. I just yeah. I thought it was mainly based around passivism, but I know otherwise now. <laughs> I think that the, the, the peacemaking comes from, from a sense, I mean, the original phrase was that we discovered a condition by which wars were unnecessary. Mm. Um, and I, and I, I think that comes from the process of silence, and that's certainly been my own experience. I think each of us go on our own journey with this, and it's changed in its experience for me. Mm. And there's a, there's a lovely little anecdote, I think it is accepted as being an anecdote rather than perhaps a factual occurrence, where, where two of the earlier, earliest Quakers, George Foltz and, uh, and William Penn, who you might know has went off and formed Pennsylvania, so not a man who mm. tended to sit around doing nothing. Um, but he, he, um, 
Uh, William Penn, when he first came, was of, was of the social caste that, that he wore a sword. Mm. Um, and uh, he was quite troubled by that. And he was going to these Quaker meetings and he was sitting with his sword and he said to George Fox, and he says, do you think I don't want to take the sword off? <laughs> and uh, George Fox said, didn't say to him, you must take your sword off. He didn't say that. He said, he said well, you know, wear it as long as you can. And, uh, and William Penn sort of carried on wearing his sword. And then, and then a, a period of time later, it doesn't say how, how long, a period of time later, um, William Penn turned up with, without his sword, and George Fox said to him, so where's the sword, William? He said, I took your advice, and I wore it as long as I could. <laughs> and, 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 and I think that's, that's the experience, is that people come to these things on their own. There is no pressure. There is only an experience that, mm. that you know, perhaps William Penn has never met people before who didn't feel the need to wear a, a sword. Mm. And I think that was my experience. I'd never, lived, I'd never come to a group of people who, 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 for whom that peace testimony was possible. Mm. So it never sort of, I'd never really, uh, so, and, and that's what I had a space to move into mm. rather, than a, rather than a stick to beat me with. Right. Mm. Yeah, that's that's mm. what I offered really. Mm. Mm. As for, when I um, first started coming I saw the testimonies, I, I did think they could be, if I was going to join, that would be something I had to believe. So how do you get, mm. um, it, sort of maybe thinking of them as commandments or yeah. something like that. Right. But as, you, as I get closer in worship to, that of God um, in me, then the testimonies just seem to be the way things are. It's not that I um, I wanted to be a Quaker, so I thought I'd take them on. It's it's just as I get to that place in me which just seems to be true, then the testimonies just seem to be true, mm. and it it just seems to be um, have been a completely natural progression. And the closer I've got to them, or I suppose I've been coming for about five years, and now um, I feel closer to that space in me, and I feel that they are with me um, all the time mm. now. So I'm, I'm aware of them all the time, rather than just being something I had to be aware of in meeting or something that I'd have to take on board in order to come here. Right. It just seems to be a part of me. Mm -hmm. So on that, you talked about the journey, so that you obviously mm. talked about a journey there. Do you feel how far into that journey are you? Like, like it's, towards... <coughs> I feel that, um, well, I'm going to be joining over the next month or two um, and yeah, becoming a Quaker. So I, I, I just feel that I'm at the stage in the journey where I, I feel ready to join and, oh, um, and commit to this. So it's like a major stopping point and then on to something greater... Or, or it, it doesn't feel like um, anything major. I think the, th the thing with coming here is it's such a slow burner. And I think some people come here and things don't happen straight away. And so they can be put off by that and not come. Yeah. And there's, I think it's just you become all yourself when you're here. And it took me, I, I, came, I think I came here for about nine months just sort of like circling around before I decided I wanted to dive in and see what it was like. Okay. Um, so it's, it, I, I thought when I came to the point where I'd join, then it'd feel completely natural. So it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like a big step or anything. It just feels like a yeah, natural progression. Cool. Mm -hmm. and I was just going to say, so the Quakers in general, they don't, it doesn't appear to have a particularly strong sort of evangelical um, tradition, uh, or maybe not tradition, but I mean, in general, Quakers don't appear to. I, I mean, uh, for me, that's quite a, a sort of attractive thing in a, in a community that you know they don't try and push it in your face. But um, but you know, for a small group of um, a sort of, I suppose, religious groups, uh, is there an evangelical sort of element to it? Do you try and promote it? Or sort of, you know? I mean, I think. From, probably from what you've heard from uh, what Ben said, you know, each of us has come to Quakers. Right. You know, we've come, we've come to it because we've mm. been searching for a space to, um, to be who we are and to, to, to find a space where we can share our, our spiritual journey right. with other people. So, so there will not be a great deal of point in us trying to persuade anybody because that would go against everything that Quakers do. I mean, you, mm. you know, you, all you need to come here is to be open to. Right to whatever 
you know you're looking for. Right. Having said all that, though, I actually do think that that is one weakness of modern Quakerism that we're not very good about telling people telling people what we've got to offer. I wouldn't want to advocate mm. evangelism at all, mm. but I think a lot of people, I mean, like yourselves, you've come to us as a project, but you might not have known anything about us otherwise. Mm. And um, I think perhaps it, we perhaps could do better in terms of just telling people this is what we've got to offer so that people who might might benefit from coming would know about us. Mm -hmm. I, hadn't, I hadn't heard very much on Quakers mm -hmm. at all. We seem mm -hmm. really modest in the way you practice, mm -hmm. and just because a lot of religions do really push it on you and preach it. So yeah. That seems like a really unique and valuable quality, though, yeah. rather than trying to enrol people into your religion as such. Mm -hmm. I, I, I understand it. I have friends who, who belong to churches who do believe that they have a message that they, they have a duty to carry, and I, and, I, and I struggle to understand that, but they've explained it to me, and I do have some understanding of that now, that as they see it, that what they have is important, and indeed people who don't have it are in danger, and therefore they feel they have a duty that they have to share it. And I do understand that. That's not a Quaker sense. I don't think people, be, I don't think Quaker believe, I don't think you find many Quakers that believe in a punishing God. Mm. I don't think you'll find many Quakers that believe in the kind of God that's going to send us to internal damnfire. Yeah, I just don't think that's a kind of very Quaker outlook. Mm. Um, and so therefore we don't really feel the need to go out and save people from this imminent danger. Mm. You know? So I think that's what, probably why there has been, there was an evangelical period in, in, mm. in, in Quaker history. I mean, the sort of mid-Victorian times, they were out there shoving the things. So, and the very earliest Quakers genuinely believed that they were going to be the rebirth of the early Christian faith. I mean, they really did believe that everyone was going to join them. Um, I think that that, um, that, that, that faded. Mm. But, um, but you know, there have been times in Quaker history where they have felt they had a really strong message and they've been out there giving it. I mean, Quakers used to, the early Quakers would be preaching from hilltops, going into churches, disturbing church services. And, <laughs> you know, they, I mean, they were out there and giving it. And, uh, and as Sheila says, that's not really how we do it. Although there is a debate in the society about whether we could be doing more mm. to, to let people know what, what is on offer. Just what um, we've got to offer, really, yeah. I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my, it was pure chance that I ended up here. I mean, it really was. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I was, didn't even know really quite what I was looking for, or even that I was really looking for anything. Mm -hmm. But a completely separate social function took me to a meeting house in Horsham, I think it was. Oh, oh nice space. Yeah, <laughs> nice, you know. And oh, they still exist. You know, I mean, I, I, mean, I knew about them from history. I mean, I knew mm, about yeah. the sort of, you know, their, their, their um, civil war. Uh, kind of existence. I had no idea they were still around. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And it took me months to, sell, to summon the courage to actually come through that door. I actually came to the door a couple of times and went home. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, I have no upbringing in any kind of faith system or, or anything, completely mm. alien to me. But I knew that I was something, I was, there was an itch that needed scratching. And, mm. I, mean, I, I actually came in, I, that's supposed to understating it. I came from a period in my life when I was in quite bang in trouble, to be honest with you. I came to Brighton a bit of a mess. Um, and was looking for things to, to kind of perhaps drag me out of that hole. And I'd met some people who told me about that, that sort of faith had helped them. But I'd, I'd tried a couple of other sort of faith spaces, some of the more traditional ones that I knew about. Mm. And it just felt, I felt like a real square peg. I mean, I was not comfortable mm. there at all. So, but when I came in here, again, I wasn't, I wasn't completely sold on it first time. But I came back. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I, as I, you know, as I came, wasn't exactly as Ben described. I circled it for nine months. I think at least a similar sort of, sort of period of time that, mm. that I wasn't sure. I mean, I would, t I would arrive just before the meeting started, leave as soon as it left, mm. not talk to anyone, and then I bumped into a Quaker on a bus and suddenly <laughs> realised that they'd spotted me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and that was it. I was slowly drawn into the community. <coughs> I think as much as anything. Mm. And then after I started thinking about what, what do these people believe and what's going on here and started to look at inside myself, mm. well, I found the silence really painful when I first came. Mm. I mean, it was not a thing of beauty. I mean, I was really uncomfortable with it when I first came and still can be, I have to say. I, you know, I think it's for my comfort and discomfort. Mm. I think that's quite healthy. I mean, you know, I think there's a discipline and a challenge. I come from a slightly Spartan wing, I think, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of Quakerism. I believe that, 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 it's that what I've found here is a set of guidelines and self-discipline, which I bad and backing in my life. And I, and I have, to my own astonishment, picked up exactly as Ben described, some, some sort of Christian thinking, which I would never have thought of me. <laughs> yeah. But I have certainly still come to understand what these, these Christians are talking about. So, mm. uh, for me, maybe I disagree with, mm. with other people who've used that terminology, but I've certainly found that there are some really basic things and teachings of, of Jesus that I sort of think, 
that's what he was talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that kind of aha. Yeah, just one thing I'd like, one other thing I'd like to say, because we've talked about ourselves a lot. All we haven't mentioned at all is about, you know, the what the the community in terms of children and all that sort of thing. I mean, Caroline's little boy comes, doesn't he? And he does, and he he loves it. He's very very happy here, and it actually that's that's if I, I mean, if there was no other reason for me to come here, I would come here for him. Although it's it's amazing for both of us. Um, oh, but this oh, is he's five. Um, he's been coming here. Last time. Yeah, he was here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, they they do get used to the silence and actually learn to learn to love it. Mm. And he yes. has this whole amazing community of incredible people to to grow up in, and that is such a gift. Mm. You know, that's such a gift for him. Thanks. It's often lacking as well in a lot of children's lives. Yeah. I think. And yes, it, it is. Yeah, and and other adults for him to relate to, and other children, and all these mm. you know, different points of view, and, <coughs> and just a, a totally. Do you get sorry? Do you get very many families coming? Or is, like, is yeah, yeah. We, we're doing this meeting. I think that does vary. I mean, I'd say the same. My children are grown up now, but I started coming when they were four and six, and I was a single parent all the time they were growing up. So being part of this community with other families was great, and. Um, my daughter, they, they kind of do um, residential events for teenage Quakers and Becky went off to sort of uh, young women's weekends and things. And it just helped her so much in terms of self-esteem and to, confidence. I used to go to some of them because my mum's been in the tender for about for nearly 10 years now. Mm. And I remember just, you know, how it's quite amazing really a group of very young people can sit for an hour in silence and really enjoy it and you wouldn't expect them to but if you start at a young age it really does become a very sort of you know acceptable thing to do you just you feel really comfortable mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was yeah it was really useful for me and my sister when we were and it's a real, it's a real space to come to if you're stressed, depressed, mm. anxious, mm. confused. <laughs> I mean, when I, you know, when I first came to meeting, it was I just I felt like I'd come home. You know, I really did. It had been a, a long struggle of of seeking different faiths, different things going on, and it really was just like coming home. And even if now, when I'm sort of stressed and confused and everything's awful. And I come to meeting, and it is, you know, it's just like stepping into a pool of clear water. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's wonderful. It's a release. It's a relief. It it's, just, it's just a, yeah. a wonderful place to be. It just feels like such a friendly space in here. And, like, you've got the cafe and everything, and it's just like such a, um, I don't know, just the whole kind of, the atmosphere is really, just really friendly and welcoming. Yeah. And I think that's I think really it's helpful. just accepting, really, isn't it? Mm. You don't mm. feel like you're going to be judged on any level yeah. at all. Mm. In, that's right. And that's not, I don't think, the way that maybe you might feel in, you know, certain church halls or, um, mm. sort of... You'd worry about what you were wearing or yeah. Maybe, you know, too much makeup or you know, things like that, just mm. because. Yeah, you never know. Don't yeah, know, <laughs> yeah you know. I suppose it's yeah, it's different. I'm <laughs> mm -hmm. um, sorry, this is quite a change of topic, but I just wanted to know how you become an elder. <laughs> um, well, you get asked. Oh, really? yeah, there's, okay. We have an appointment. <laughs> there's another. There's lots of committees. In we like we like committees, um, and uh, and they they sit in silence and try to glean the will of God. Um, uh, is one way of putting it. Perhaps not everyone in the committee would see it that way, or not everyone would use that terminology. But but that's how it's done, and and, the, and that uh, nominations is, is not appointments. Nominations um, put forward. Now, personally, I was asked last year, and I declined. I had other things going on in my life, and I was asked again. And, 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 I, and I went away, and I, and I literally, I sat with it, I read through what it implied, I sat with it, I opened myself to, to whatever, and, I came, and the answer came back clear as a bell, you do it. And so I, I said just, yes, even though I wasn't really, I don't really feel myself qualified to do it, but I, I, but I, but I said yes anyway. I wasn't sure if you, had, if you had to be a Quaker for a certain amount of time, or so there's no... You do have to be a member to be an okay. elder. There are certain things that people who are not members can do, but elders... Have to be members. Okay. Yeah, there's a nice, little, another nice little anecdote in Quaker faith and practice of someone asked to be being an elder and kind of protesting how you know she didn't feel up to the job and what have you. And the answer come back: we have to take what we can get. It's quite comforting, really. We're nearly out of time, aren't we? <laughs> Do you know, is there any burning questions left to be asked? There was something. It's just, it's, 
Okay. Can I just ask a really mundane question? Um, who gets to change the book? Like Quaker Faith and Practice? Oh, right. Well, that's, that's very easy because that sort of... Go, basically, whoever, the, the central body, the central body, which is called Yearly Meeting, that's mm. based in Friends House in London. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they would... I don't know. I don't actually know whether it's kind of every 40 years or whatever, but at, mm. reg, at some point there's a decision that it needs to be revised. And every single meeting would be asked to look at it, suggest new texts, suggest mm. amendments. And so it would be very much a kind of society-wide process. And in a way, that for me is a kind of um, thing about the way things work in Quakers, because it's very much, you know, if there's something that's coming up from grassroots, mm. that's fine. It's not like them up there, mm. send down mm. edicts. It's much more that grassroots takes things forward and things get changed at grassroots level. Mm. An awful lot of what Quakers have done, kind of historically, has been from grassroots level, and that's things like Oxfam, mm. um, and what else? CND. CND. Uh, the one I was very keen on is, is the Marriage Guidance Council. I, mean, I couldn't believe that came out of Quakers. It's now called Relate, but apparently that started as a Quaker concern. Oh, really? <laughs> I, know, yeah. I think that's practical, that yeah. is. That's, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah, they have all come out of... People's enthusiasm, yeah. really. Mm, Someone yeah. has an enthusiasm for something and then, you know, takes it to their meeting and they take it forward to the wider Quaker community. So. And it can seem like a grinding process, mm. but I, I think it, it, it's... But because it's a, because we are, I, I guess, about the way we do things more than what we do, that that's 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 how things that certainly I feel comfortable with come out of it, mm. rather than things that I feel uncomfortable with. Mm. Mm. 